And Ryan is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for Fire Rover. He is focused on bringing innovative safety solutions to the market. Two of the solutions have won distinguished Edison Innovation Awards for industry safety and consumer products. Ryan has been compiling data and publishing the reported waste and recycling facility fires in the US and Canada and the waste and recycling facility fires and reports since 2016. In addition, he is on the National Fire Protection Association Technical Committee for Hazardous Materials. Ryan regularly speaks on the topic of fire and the problems facing waste and recycling industries to include early detection solutions, proper fire planning, and early stage fire risk mitigation. We welcome Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Again, I know like I, I met Paul, I think every single waste expo for five years, waste times and all that stuff. And again, I live in Ohio, I'm actually from Michigan. Our, our, we're based out of Detroit. We started a scrap metal facility in the back of, literally in the back of a scrap metal facility, which I'll show you guys. Um, but the reality is, is that like, who here doesn't know the graphic fire? So, I mean, I think it's one of those, when I started in 15, you know, I basically, I was at a paper plastic recycling show in Chicago. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys have been to it, but you know, it's a great show. Um, I show my system to a guy named Brent Shows, who is now with GFL, but he was with Advanced Disposal, he was with Waste Management. Um, you know, and basically, I show him the system, and he's like, I love it, why do I need it? And I'm like, you fire, right? And like, I had already done Google Alerts and other things, and he basically said, well, do my competitors, right? And really, that's the, the real big question, is good operators, bad operators. Is it a bad operator that has fires or a bad operator that has more fires, right? Or is it is, is fire inherent in the risk of what we do? And the reality is, is that, you know, the reason I started trending data was not to sell more systems, right? I could have cared less. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, we have um, two of our partners, we're still selling, and we have over 100 like, folks, we have 500 facilities, we're in five countries, so like things are great, they're, they're, you know, from a fire perspective, there's a lot of money in our industry and in a lot of other industries. But I think waste and recycling was hit pretty hard, um, you know, with a, a rash of fires, and you know, I was, in 15, 16, 17, I was really warned. You know, I had a slide that had a wave that was coming, and I'm like, the lithium, the lithium ion battery wave is gonna come. Um, it hit in 2018. So, you know, the, um, you know, this was basically the 365 that we see. And again, at that point, we were covering, you know, there's, there's 10,000 facilities. And again, when I say that, I'm talking about scrap metal facilities, MERS, transfer station, you know, and all the different pieces. There's about 10,000, um, the best of our, best of my knowledge that I can get. Um, they came from the EREPS numbers in 2000, I think, 2013. Do you, do you include truck fires? I do not include truck fires and I do not include landfill fires. These are only facilities and they're only reported by the media. So the reason I would do, like, I know about a lot of the fires, obviously, right? I see them on a daily basis for on the front line, um, really fighting all these fires. But the reality is, is that we, um, you know, we really, um, you know, we, we really have a unique solution that needed to be proven in itself and you know, waste and recycling kind of hit at the right time. Where in, you know, the, the lithium ion battery wave, when it hit, it hit across the globe. So this was in Japan, they had five times the amount of fires in 2018 than they had. Um, and again, the other thing was like, as we're trying to drive awareness, really I was doing this to build the ROI, right? Because the reality is, is that you know, nobody wants to pay for safety. And you know, I don't sell the safety guys, right? Like I love safety, I think it's great. I have another product that you know I brought into the market 15 years ago that still does really well. Um, but the reality is from a safety perspective, like this is insurance, right? So when I say that, you know, we've uh, and I'll get into you know our numbers. Um, so this was our performance in, in uh, 2022, which was the first year we actually went out and shared the data. And if you look at it, I mean, there's a lot of different things that we need to do from a definition perspective. So what is, and that's really why it took us so long to, to be able to put this out. The good news is I'll be able to put it out in 2023. But the reality is the difference between our system and any other system is that we use human beings, right? So that's what our patent really wrapped around the utility patent. It's, it's basically, we look at every single piece of hay to find the needle in a haystack. So 
we, you know, if you look like we could have had out of our facilities, and this is about 350 or over 500 from this year, um, but we had hundreds of thousands of false positives, right? And like anyone who has our system knows, like we don't call on hundreds of thousands, right? We do call a lot, but we're only calling on confirmed fighters or hotspots or ones that we think could be, right? Because we use smoke analytics, we use optical plane detection, we use uh, thermal cameras, so we're constantly watching these. And again, it's, you know, our, our team doesn't get, um, you know, the uh, kind of the numbness to, hey, we're gonna alarm, fire, alarm, fire. So, you know, when we put these into our, you know, some of our customers, it, when we've actually given them the ability to control it themselves, they typically, they burn out, right? They, they stop looking at them and they start, based, you know, putting a piece of tape on certain keys to try to make sure that they don't have to see it. And then, of course, a fire happens and they're not there to, uh, you know, to, be, able to, to be able to react to it. Um, we, out of the 2,880 2, fires, um, we pressurized our system 12% of the time, so 344 times. Um, we sprayed 137 times and we dispatched the fire department 146 times. And like the reason that, um, you know, the reason that we're actually spraying more or calling more than spraying is because, um, you know, we do have thermal only systems. We have, for landfills, we do an on-watch system. So there's a lot of different, you know, types of solutions that we do offer. But like the reality is, is that, you know, what we have to do, my belief was that if there's 10,000 facilities, and now I'm covering, in theory, four to five percent of that, we're going to have less fires, right? And, you know, less reported fires. And actually, we saw the opposite. So if you're seeing in, uh, you know, in 2021, 2022, and, and we're forecasted this year to actually break the numbers. So it's like, you know, 2020 didn't really count. It was, you know, the COVID year. So, you know, I don't know if it was more spring cleaning. There was all these things that we really had no idea. But I assume that we'll have more known fires by us seeing and knowing of these fires, which none of those are included in here. Um, we've never had a catastrophic loss start in an area that we protect. So we have had catastrophic losses in facilities, but it wasn't in an area that we protect. I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of examples of those. Um, you know, if, if you have two tip floors and you're only protecting the west tip floor and you know, the east tip floor has a fire and it's coming all the way through, at a certain point, you know, we can't just, we can see through smoke, but we can, we can shoot in smoke and darkness, but we're not going to want to shoot into fire, you know, to uh, firefighters, right? We're constantly always playing that game. And I think the reality is this, is that the waste and recycling, I'm pretty proud of the industry now, 10 years later, right? Nine years later, because the industry has really cleaned itself up from a fire protection perspective, right? You know, when there's a fire, they have a plan. There are disaster plans. And our system is a number of different layers. But really, if you can clear your floor, if you can keep your pile small, if you can ensure that your piles you know, aren't 20, 30 feet high, there's so many different things that you can do from an operational perspective. So I don't want to make it seem like we're the only solution. Um, but the reality is, you know, our solution really works with our clients in a number of different ways. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I'll kind of get into that as we go. So, and if anyone has questions, feel free to ask. And I'm happy to answer and I also I pass for people like I, I don't know if you like it it just doesn't go well the time but you know, that's kind of a fun thing but so early on I was looking at the reality is it's not it's not an issue if you have fires right because it's inherent risk in what we do 50 percent of the fires that we're seeing are traditional hazards so your propane tanks your chemicals um, you know the you know, paint thinner I mean you know you name it it's been around for 50 years we've been causing fires for 50 years um, you know, batteries are obviously that other 50% that we're seeing now. We're seeing that those batteries grow in, into a perspective of, you know, even if you're, you know, propane tank, you can get a spotter and sort differently. Um, they're trying to do a lot of robotics and they're trying to do a lot of innovation to figure out how to basically do a pre-sort on the sort line. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is it's all about controlling a fire and controlling the severity, right? We do not want to have a catastrophic loss. And so, if we look at it, um, this is the numbers that, you know, like lithium ion batteries cost US and Canada $1.2 billion a year. And again, these numbers came from Unomia, which is in the UK, they're about six times smaller than us. I use that as an assumption most of the time for most of my fires. Um, but as you can see, you know, the uh, 
it, it's, it's the wage site operators and the insurance companies who are, are bearing most of this cost, right? You also do have the fire service. And so I'm constantly pushing, you know, I know, you know we have some state folks here and everyone's like, you know, I, I get a lot of phone calls with my annual report and I think, you know, but really what I believe is that we are doing everything right from, like the manufacturers are good people, right? All of us here want more batteries. I mean, Kurt Sander for NWRA literally just said on a podcast yesterday that he had 11 lithium ion batteries when he was going through security. Um, you know, and again, you all do too, right? Like, if you look at your, I don't know what kind of your ones on me, but there's three of those alone, right? So add your computer, add your phone, add your phone case charger and all the other things that go with it. Um, so the reality is we spent a ton of money on education. And again, I'm all for education. I try to do it, I do everything we can to try to drive, you know, teaching people the hazards of batteries and then most importantly teaching them how to, um, you know, how to, to bring them and drop them off safely um, without putting them into the waste or recycling stream. But th the reality is, is that, you know, all the money that's being, that, that has been given is typically spent on education. So, you know, like it's not spent on training the fire departments, giving the fire departments equipment or helping the operators. So, Again, that to me is the big thing that needs to change. Um, so if I was sitting in front of a senator, which I have a number of times, you know, they usually like, I'm like, How, what do you think of recycling? And they're like, love it. But what they're thinking about is an aluminum can that's going into a bag and they don't think about it. And the reality is, is that if you look at the, the true recycling, from my perspective is, I mean, C&D operators and, and uh, scrap metal operators keep 70% of the pounds out of landfill. So those are, that's the real recycling, right? The stuff that we do at our home and the curbside and all these different pieces, it's a smaller amount. And most of the time we're educating just towards that, right? It's just that consumer. When really we need to educate, you know, you can't educate your way out of a hurricane, right? You're gonna have batteries that come out or a fire that this building burns down. How many batteries are you gonna have when you're trying to clean up that mess? Um, this is the data from the actual claims data from 2018. Um, which again, you can see here, like this is shredders and then this is batteries. So a lot of people would, would say, hey, why are you telling everybody we're having fires? It's a, it's a, it's a you know, industry secret. Well, the reality is, is that it's the claims that drove away all the insurers. So when I go into really talk to someone about the fire protection equipment, I spend probably 30 to 50% of my time talking to insurance companies. We are almost FM certified on our continuous flow system. That should happen in Q1. So um, we've been, it's taken us eight years to get to this point. Uh, so really the, um, you know, if you look at it from a risk mitigation perspective, if you saw the number of 400 and we only had one catastrophic loss that was public that we know about, we didn't, like, we put out our fire, you know, the fire department didn't show up. There's a number of factors why it went bad, but that was one. There's 400 others, none of them had a system. And again, I don't say that in a way as a sales approach, it's more of a, like, it's just a fact, right? And, and if you're trying to mitigate risk, if you're an insurance company, the insurer is gonna be more apt to give you a better prescriptive policy if you have this type of ability inside your, uh, you know, inside as part of your portfolio of fire protection equipment. Um, so, you know, the, the reality is, is that fire prevention, again, that is, you gotta be a good operator, right? I mean, anyone who says that you can cut corners and do all these other things, obviously I don't think anyone would ever say that. So the reality is, is you have to be a really good operator. Professional response. You have to be cognizant of the fact that professional response is not what we think it is, right? Like if we think that, you know, you might live in Detroit and you, you actually do have like 500, in, in the US and Canada, it's like 1.2 million firefighters and 700,000 young are volunteer firefighters. And again, we've already said that they are not given equipment, right? They don't have the proper equipment. So the reality, like when they're going to deal with the lithium ion battery fire, which I'm gonna show you a couple of really fun ones, it's like fun in a, I guess it's not supposed to be great anymore, but anyways, um, the, the reality is like, you need to understand what your fire department can do and what they can't do. They need to understand where like all the equipment is laid out. So when they come, they're more apt to fight because if not, all they're gonna do is protect the public. Usually, again, most of the time, there's not employees that are in danger. So, you know, most of the time, our lease facilities are easy to get out of, right? I mean, half the, half the doors are open, and, you know, they're open to the public. So, really, for us, the goal is, like, you have a fire breakdown, it starts, 
there's 10 minutes in between that and when the fire department comes, we call the fire department, they get on scene and we really focus on those initial 10 minutes. And then we try to set the tripwire as early in the process as possible by looking at heat abnormalities, by looking for symptoms, by looking for smoke versus steam and trying to figure out if there's something that's happening that we can catch early, which again, about 85% of our fires that we catch are early enough that someone else is dealing with them or they go out by themselves or a rotor rips them out or something happens, right? Because we're, we're you know, the, the goal is always catch as early as possible. So, and again, like, I can get into the kind of the system, but the, the reality is is that we are the brain, right? We are the nozzles, the cameras, the, the monitoring equipment, and then we are the people who are looking at those, verifying, and actually fighting the fires on the front line. So it is a person, right? And I know I always do a, a presentation, and then after they're like, oh, there's a human involved, right? This is not AI. It is AI to a point, but the reality is is that you know, we have a human being who looks at it and verifies it. And the reason the human being is so important, it's not just what they shoot, it's what they don't shoot. And it's how they shoot. Because it's not like fire, go, shh, hit. Well, what if the person's standing there now in front of that when they're trying to fight it? Now you just hit, like, there was um, five, by, five times one of the systems, I believe it was the head of the system, but it was an AI system in Europe shot, and five times it hit the back of a rotor operator. Right, because there's literally a truck that's right in the way and they shoot right at it. So a lot of what we do, especially with the ion batteries, is try to soak the area around it. You're not stopping a fire. Anyone who tells you that you can stop thermal runaway, like again, everybody in the world is now selling a product and you know you can call it whatever you want, but we use just water and it seems to work just fine. We use F five hundred, we use foams, we use gels. So we're using all these different materials, but the reality is is that what you have to do is stop the chain, right? Fire starts, I can't let it burn anything else. And again, that seems intuitive when you have a tip floor and you have one battery and you spray it, you know, your, the, the product we use is 150, 150 times wetter than water, so it will suck in around it, so then that fire can burn itself out and it won't start another fire. But then when we're dealing with lithium ion battery recyclers, where we have hundreds of thousands of batteries everywhere, we're constantly, um, you know, it's a completely different type of risk that I can show you guys as well. Um, so there's really like, there's three different types of our system. Um, it's it's uh, the box unit, which is a 20 by 8 by 8 container, and then that one can have a mast on it. And so that's for like the outdoor scrap metal unit, scrap metal facilities, paper facilities, outdoor storage, CMD facilities, um, you know, and then that box can actually be put like outside of a building and then literally all you're gonna see are cameras and nozzles coming over the top. And like, we don't sell a, a equipment. We sell equipment up front, but really we're the service, right? We're your bodyguard. We guarantee that the system works. We guarantee, we don't guarantee if it's fired out. We guarantee that it's gonna work or we get penalized. Um, we, you know, it's a full maintenance monitor and full bumper to bumper warranty for the life of the contract. So everyone doesn't love those. But we are in nine of the top ten waste and recycling companies at this point, um, you know, and we are doing what Tesla and others. I mean, so there's a this type of fire protection, and I always I kind of say it all the time: the waste and recycling. Like, we're not in the waste and recycling industry. I'm in the fire protection industry, and just happen to have a lot large need for services and waste and recycling, which you know hopefully will work out. Um, but. So I'll, th this is what our unit looks like. And again, we are based in Farmington Hills. This is our old facility, we have a brand new facility. So if you guys want to set up a tour for everyone to come down or do you know, a, a SWAN event where you come and you basically watch this and you can actually shoot that unit, it's kind of fun to put a fire out or two. Um, but basically it shoots about 150 feet. So the reality is, is that one box can do about 280 feet by 140 feet in a, a, a standard tip floor. So that's, again, unless you have complications and other things. We can put up the three nozzles, three cameras. And then the big thing that we're doing now is continuous flow solutions. So we've been doing them since, like we, we have a waste energy facility for uh, Covanta and you know, we have another 20 facilities we've been doing. We just, we're about to finish a battery recycling facility that we have 106 cameras, 57 nozzles, um, and 250,000 gallon tank. I mean, this is like the Titanic of, I hate to use the word Titanic, yeah, and that has the wrong nomenclature, but I'm basically calling my shot on it. Um, I mean, this is the, you know, the, the in 
once it's FM certified, it will be one of the number one uh, fire protected uh, buildings in the world. Um, okay, so, so this is how it works, right? So we see an abnormality, we look at it, our agent verifies it, calls the fire department, calls someone who, and again, you as a customer get to decide. Do you call the fire department first? Do you call us first? Do you call your supervisor first? You know, so really it's, it's on our customers to tell us who to call, when to call, and really update us, right? Because I mean, the reality is, is you're only as good as, as how good our information is. Um, we charge our unit, which is nitrogen. Um, the box is heated and cooled, so again, it can sit outside, it can sit inside, it can sit on mezzanine. And then we're basically shooting a fire. I mean, you see how smoky it is. And that's one of the things that really shocked me when I first got into this. I'm like, these buildings actually fill up with a lot of smoke a lot quicker than you would think. And you know, a lot of the, uh, fire, the, the, the fire professionals will say that you have to have vents in your, in your ceiling because you can pull that smoke out. If you don't, it starts to come out e e either side and it makes it harder for the firefighters to come and fight the fire. So we go in, we put it out, and most of the time we're not shooting like, our, our, you know, it's six to eight minutes if we shoot full load, go. But most of the time we're shooting for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, that type of thing, right? So it is one of those that, um, you know, um, it, it, what you think is not necessarily what, you, what really happens in reality. This is the facility I was talking about. Um, this was a hot works incident. And again, we put this fire out. This, that, it's, that blast happened again two weeks later three times the size. We did the exact same thing up right there. Do you see how we're not moving? And again, this is like 10 times fast because nobody has a tension span anymore, but the, uh, <laughs> I thought someone would appreciate that. Um, but so what happened- I watched two hours of fire over video last night. Well, and again, we do have a YouTube page and I do have a TikTok page because again, I use TikTok to try to educate kids not to throw babies into burning crap, right? Like I used to smoke cigarettes. How many times did I rip up a pack and say, and throw away every lighter that I've ever had? Well, TikTok, there's a trend where if you're gonna quit vaping, you take all the vapes, you throw them into a, uh, a garbage bag, you put soap and water on them to ruin them, right? And then you take it, and like they show, dropping right into the trash. Can you imagine what happens when that gets on a pretty sort line? Actually, everyone in here probably doesn't even imagine if you've seen it. So this is one of those, like in here, the reason I was, I, was, I keep going back to that first part, we're connected. We're waiting for this guy to walk in. I'm not telling him what to do, right? We are we are literally a bodyguard. I'm not. It, it's not my job to tell everybody or my customers how to react and how to respond because again, that's all their policy. So Ryan, in this video, who's moving the camera? So one of our one of our agents. So your guy is my guy owns this, yeah. And so they're waiting for this person. Like, again, personally, I wouldn't say that you should walk through you know, the, the gases that come off of a lot of these lithium ion batteries. No one's talking about this yet. And it's gonna be like, mark my words, in the next three years, they're doing study after study in Sweden and all these other, you know, this is all I hear about when I go to Europe, is that you're actually breathing these in. And it, you know, there's always that hero who works for you, who's been putting fires out for 50 years. And when I say hero, I don't say it negatively. Like they, they're like, I got this, right? It's the same guy who, you know, like, does, you know, throws the pig on, on uh, you know, on, on a weekend. But that guy's gonna go in and basically put his life in danger. And by the way, the firefighters don't like that hero because then they have to go in and get him, right? So they, it actually makes them like, I mean, uh, there was a Milwaukee firefighter who spoke at one of the conventions I was at, and he made it really clear that it's not a good thing. Like, just, um, you know, and, and again, it's like anything else, right? These batteries, like this one right here, th these are button batteries. and. What you're gonna see is this guy starts to go, again, everything I do is fast typically, unless I don't tell you. We're spraying this with, we have this and we have a tap system. So we're hitting this with two different types of fire suppressor. One's a foam, at floor and three, 100% of floor and three foam. And then one is a, uh, the fire rover uh, F500 encapsulated. It's not, it's, it's an encapsulator agent, which is, it's a, um, it's a product that a lot of people <coughs> use. But I mean, you see how fast something like that can, if that explodes and it hits the next pallet and the next pallet and the next pallet and the next pallet, you literally have catastrophic loss, right? Or you're gonna lose a big part of your building. We stop that from happening. Again, I, I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, it, it's pretty freaking amazing the stuff that we do. And again, I didn't invent this, right? One of my good friends and, and, and you know, two of his partners did it. I'm, I'm a partner now, but you know, the reality is, is that they, like, when I first saw the system, I mean, I was like, what is this thing? And then we're selling it, and like, you know, like deliberately or indeliberately, we really had no idea.
idea. And what we've come to is like, FM has just did a study that says that our type of early detection will save 92% of water. And again, everyone talks about PFAS and they talk about leachate and all these different things. Like, what do you think happens when you spray water onto, or a million gallons of water onto a fire, right? Because that's really the way, it's always water, water, water. This one is a facility that you're gonna see a, uh, that's a bike battery and it shoots. You start five fires in this building, okay? We're gonna go in and our operator shoot one, shoot two, shoot three, shoot four, shoot five. But think about this, right? In the old days, what would have happened? The loader operator goes to pull it out. The worst thing the loader operator can do is pull a load out. I'm not saying that like eight out of 10 times, it's fine. But if you have a deep seated fire and they rip into it, you literally call the worst fire. So, you know, it's like, and you also, if you have someone fighting this fire, he, he could get shot by, some, you know, could get hit by, by any of this material that's flying off, right? You know, we had one almost hit the camera. So, you know, again, employees should evacuate. Um, this is, uh, and again, we deal with explosions. This is hazard material. We do a ton of hazard material facilities. Um, but again, you know, just to show like, this is when we need, like, we catch it this fast, we we're spraying, like our thousand gallons is enough typically. Now, if it's not, the fire department comes, and you know that's why we have them. We've we've already called them, typically 15 minutes before a, uh, a sprinkler system would go off. So, Ryan, are you saying that most of the fires that we're seeing are uh, battery caused? 50 uh, percent. So I would say one of every two that you see, and again, this is based on like 20 surveys and going through. I mean, I, I write an article every month in Moisture 16. Kind of like so, I really do study all these things. So like, you know, we've done study. There's been surveys done and. Yeah, and the reality is, is now lithium ion batteries get blamed for more fires than they've actually caused, right? Because, but they are the, the reason, like, you know, I, I always try to show this, right? Like, this is what we see in the beginning, and this is why I typically start with this, is that, like, lithium ion batteries are not causing all the fires. If you look at this right here, this is, has nothing to do, this summertime spike that we see every year because of heat and because of dryness, that has nothing to do with the, the batteries. Now, the battery might be causing it, and it might be exacerbated by it, but the reality is that you know the summertime spike that we see is actually because more briquettes, more fireworks, other like pool chemicals, other things that we see in the waste stream. In the fourth quarter, we used to see actually a big push in fourth quarter. It has been slowing down, which has been a nice, you know. But we used to see that big push from retail, right? It was Christmas. I mean, you just see all the stuff coming. Now you're getting more boxes than you are you know, the retail stuff that was coming in before. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's caused it or not. I mean, again, I, I never want to explain to anybody that I'm an expert. I mean, my data is my data, and like, EREF redid a report on it and basically said my data was conservative. You know, EPA did a report that was very similar. They went back five more years. They said that my, like, they think that my data is, is truly, really conservative, which is what I've always tried to be, right? I'm not, I'm not here to try to scare anyone. Um, even though, I mean, yeah, batteries are like, pretty freaking scary, or can be. <coughs> um, just to give you a couple, because I mean, again, uh, the uh, like this one right here. So this was a rubber facility. We put a 3,000 degree rubber fire out in four and a half minutes. This is actually real time before the fire department arrived on scene. So the reason I show this is that first thing is is that the loader operator will wait until I pre wet. Right, let us pre-wet, let us spray it, let us make sure that we get the fire out on top and then start to dig in and start to find out how deep this fire needs to be. So pull away a layer of pre-wet. The other thing you're gonna see is we actually spray the building, right? Because I gotta make sure that this collateral asset doesn't burn. This stuff, it's already burnt, it's tired. Honestly, you know, it's, they're gonna get rid of it. It's, you know, it's not, it's not a huge deal to them. What the huge deal is the, you know, the public, the house that's next door, which now this is actually in an indoor facility, you know, seven years later. Um, but again, it doesn't look like we're spraying it, but this is, it's an encapsulated and so it works like a Pac-Man. So really it's cooling, every droplet that hits, it's actually cooling it, but it also isn't gonna burn the building. And again, like I could literally, this is a, and you'll see it, you go black to white from the smoke perspective, then they'll start getting in when they're ready. And, and I mean, we still have 40% left of <coughs> So when I hear, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, you know, six to eight minutes, I know like we did one for, for, uh, for Brad that we needed a fire department quick neck off the back to, to, to guarantee that we could get more fire, like more uh, water onto a fire. 
But again, it's like your fire marshals are typically looking at the way fires are fought 20 minutes later, not the way fires are fought with the way we fight it, which is why the standards will do change, right? I mean, it's just, you know, we were actually written in the fire protection handbook this year. It's this big, and like there was a picture of the fire rover, and like, of course, it's a big deal for us, but, um, and then FM certification is a pretty, a pretty big um, thing that will happen. This is for all you guys who have landfills. Um, we actually, we piloted this with waste management um, in a Michigan, uh, you know, uh, landfill, and you know, it's actually I was, I was there yesterday. But the uh, so basically, it's a it's a mobile early detection unit. So again, biggest issue with landfills, you know, is that you find out that there's a fire, you know, on Sunday morning when someone's driving down the street when they see you know black smoke and typically no one knew about it. Um, you know, these cameras, you can literally this this unit, it sits outside for seven days um, at a charge. It, gets powered by uh, solar power and um, we can also charge them in. We also have another solution that, like this that we're actually building just for hot work. So early detection for hot work to replace that hot work requirement. Um, you know, with one of the, we, we're, we're doing it with one of the largest paper guys in the world. So hopefully um, their legal team, I mean, they understand exactly what they're trying to get us to build. Uh, but I mean, we've already piloted it and we're about to go do a big one. This one, so we talk about variances, right? Yeah. On the previous one, where's the, where's the water? Mm -hmm. There is no water. No. So what happens is, is that we call them, they come in, they grab copper, right? They, they like deal with them. Usually, you can deal with a landfill fire, you know, again, with, if you know about it fast enough, right? It's the two days that allow that thing to continue to burn and then it starts to channel under. Um, Brad, you're not looking at yourself? <laughs> oh, that's not good for you. All right, well, I mean, you guys see this handsome fellow. <laughs> yeah. But but I mean this is again you know that that's actually his system. But the reason I bring that up is that we have had a ton of variances. I'm constantly getting in front of the fire marshals and you know the uh, state fire marshals and you know, really convincing. Them. And in the past five years, we I think we've been denied for one variance. I mean you know, so it really is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, you know the way that we're fighting these fires. So this is our outdoor storage. If you guys, get, you know, again, we can do them up to 40 feet tall. And then we also, the continuous flow solution, which is where we're running these in, in lieu of your sprinklers. Um, like th this is the first facility we did was a waste to energy facility. And then, you know, now we, you know, we have probably 30 of these out there at this point. Um, so a lot of people will do them on the tip boards instead of using the boxes. It's unlimited water. You, know, you don't have the, you know, any sort of inductor unless you induct, you know, um, you know, some of the uh, FF hundred other products, but I mean, there's also, and then actually this one too, if you can see on the, on the top, we actually have a gel system that will tap the the uh, hoppers. There's there's actually boxes behind that wall, um, and then we also will put the the uh, furnace fire out. So we'll basically, if they shut down the waste energy facility, we'll spray it down to room temperature. It takes about 18 minutes, but it's you know part of that solution. Um, again, we can do these outdoor tiny units where you know, there's really, it, there's nothing that we've never been able to do, if that makes sense. So like, you know, there's places that you can get fire protection, um, you know, where you've never been able to do it before. This is a, a, a processing yard um, for cars. And then, you know, every one of our customers, I always call it layers, right? Like most of our customers have these enforcer units, which are the smaller tap systems. They can shoot foam, they can shoot, um, you know, the encapsulator agent, they can shoot just water. And you know, it is nice. Like if you're gonna require your your um, employees to fight a fire, right? Or if you're gonna want the fire department to come on site and fight it, you wanna have this and have trained them. And so your fire, just imagine your employee. He walks over here with the, and he's standing over it, breathing in all of those feet, right? You don't want that to happen. So if you're 90 feet away, and typically most of these facilities, have enough, you know, where you can stand outside and actually spray to inside. You know, they're they're a really helpful, um, you know, tool. We have 10, 60, we have 200 um, that sit on the back of trucks. But so, do you guys have questions? So is this kind of like a like a airbag system when it comes to insurance? Do you are you noticing that some of these employees are able to get more premiums? Hundred percent. I mean, so. So literally, all I always say, to, like whoever I'm talking to, I'm like, let me talk to the compliance guy if you have one. If not, let me talk to the broker. Because typically, what will happen again, it's getting 
easier and easier. But typically, it would be like, hey, I talked to my insurance provider, they don't give you a fire worker discount. Well, they're never going to give you a fire worker discount, right? I mean, until we're FM certified for all these different things, it's still prescriptive. So they go in and they basically look at your history, they look at your operations, they look at how many fires you had, how many incidences, and then they say, okay, what are the things that you're doing to protect yourself? Backup cameras, fire worker system, you know, like sprinklers, like all the different things factor in. But yes, our solution has a lot of insurance companies are actually like working with us to come back in the industry because they were, you know, they, they rank. I mean, they're just they don't like the risk doesn't make sense from a financial perspective for what they're asking for. But you guys are still seeing. I mean, from my understanding, there's two issues, right? One is your overall risk in the world is just getting like more and more prevalent, right? And and what's happening is that those areas and the amount of money that, that used to be there for the reinsurance is actually, it, it's getting smaller. So now when you have a niche industry like this that has this, this type of, you know, you really have to, to, to differentiate yourself, especially in you know, an industry like this. Um, but we are becoming more and more recognized and that's, I mean, that's the goal. It, it, it's funny because there's innovation in waste and recycling and people, some people say there's not a lot of it, but like the reality is is that like we are fighting the fire, water, water, water approach to early detection and knockout, right? And, you know, FM just did a study, right? That was a 92% less. Like, you know, most people will say sprinkler, sprinkler systems work about 88% of the time. So one in 10 times they don't turn on or they bust through a rusted pipe or they do. Like, we make sure we have a heartbeat with the system. If anything breaks, it's a component, we come out and replace it free for life time. <coughs> like, that's all part of it. So it's like, it's a proactive fire, it's like, you know, I, I call it the Pinkerton fire, right? Like we are there as your, you know, to fight the fire for you or with you. Good question. So for those of you who don't know, we were an early adapter at our American Southfield. Um, you know, we have probably one of the best fire departments in the country, in the city of Southfield. And, and they like that we have this system because they know when they arrive on the site, that if fire hasn't already been extinguished by the fire over system, it will have been greatly suppressed, so they're dealing with much less of a problem. Um, and, and we've used had that system deploy uh, and actually spray foam numerous times, including as recently as this past Friday night. And you know, I've got I've got the fire over cameras on my phone. And you know, one one of the jokes in my household is my wife will say, You're, "Are you spying on the plan again?" <laughs> like this is not spying; this is managing. This is actually your facility, and, right? and, and uh, it's a feed hopper. So that's yeah, so our feed hopper is is, is a hydro air, and you'll watch these temperatures, and um, you know, the batteries will go to zero to plus six hundred degrees, and like that. And that's if, if you have one of these systems, and you've watched enough thermal camera imaging, you'll be able to go, "Oh yeah, that's a battery fire right there." And uh, I, we found that the ancillary benefits of having the fire over system goes beyond just fire suppression. It's, it's, it's a management tool. Uh, we can keep an eye on equipment. We know if a bearing might be heating up because it's running above the uh, you know, normal ambient temp. Um, you know, we, I can monitor the tip floor size remotely. There's a whole bunch of additional benefits beyond just the fact that these guys are making sure that you know, our fires are, are going out um, uh, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, one of the things that I think is, uh, some of you already know this, but you know, we, had a, we had a pretty major fire in our Baylor um, Labor Day weekend, actually that Friday. And that was actually outside of the area that we have covered by fire over. But for me, that was kind of, the, the, it was a looking eye out there. And that's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And so I've been talking to many of you about pushing to have better policy, EPR policy in the state, uh, like 10 other states in the United States have done in the Columbia and many other European countries. And so we've been circulating this battery policy statement where we're gonna, at some point next year, start talking to legislators and maybe push this to, uh, to uh, some sort of legislative solution. Because for my, to, to, to capitalize on what, what Ryan said, you know, we do education, but we can do more education. And we can, if we're gonna do education, we need better programming for what, what do you want folks to do with these batteries other than throw them in their trash or recycling. And then we need better on-site identification and capture technology, more AI, more, more ways of knowing that there's a potential uh, battery brewing before it becomes a thermal event. And then we need better response 
and uh, training uh, so more systems like fire over and more communication with our fire departments and my view and I think many of our colleagues agree that the folks that manufacture sell and buy these batteries ought to be paying for those those cost centers and so uh, you know it shouldn't be the public's responsibility or the operator's responsibility so this this policy statement um, I'm working with SWAN I'm working with Paul I work with the Michigan Recycling Coalition I'm working with the Michigan Municipal Municipal Risk Management Association. It's been adopted by my authority. It's been adopted by SACRA. It's been adopted by the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. And, and I think Kent County has it. I'm, I'm looking forward to Kent County signing on to it, Emmett County. And so any of you that are in the operations space and want to sign on to um, this statement, um, and, you know, I think we're going to get the, uh, the Fire Chiefs Association to sign on to it. It's going next week to the Michigan chapter of the APWA. I think the bigger tent we cast saying this is a problem, there are solutions, and we want policy around those solutions uh, so that when we start talking to elected officials in Lansing, we've got the folks lined up to support that. I think maybe sometime during lame duck next year, uh, we might have a real opportunity to push this in the right direction so that we can all have that education in that in those, the programming for the right disposition of these things that are ubiquitous and we can have those on site uh, you know, uh, opportunities to, to keep these from becoming an event that we, we don't want to see them become. I have a video I want to show you guys. But yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, first of all, everything that Mike's saying, I've been saying for eight years, and I like I appreciate that finally, I mean, I, I, my report will end up in a lot of different blogs, and I'm like, I don't know how you do it. You know, like, and again, they don't call me or anything, they just cite it for data, but then, you know, the, the, the reality is that, like, the manufacturers are doing nothing wrong. There are some manufacturers that have done some wrong things. Uh, I did an article three months ago about uh, SK, um, who actually like really burned down a CNG facility uh, knowingly, right? Like the, 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 the allegedly knowingly. Um, but you know, the reality is, is that the manufacturers are in the best position to figure out a way, whether it's a composite, whatever it is. We need to pre-sort our way out of this, right? Like we need to get these batteries out of the waste stream and just you know. Again, if there's no value to your vape when you're done using it, then what do you do with it? You just toss it, right? Like, it's not that, you know, the average American doesn't understand. And like, I know we've had success. I'm not saying that, that education's bad. Like, Brunke did, they, they were having, a, you know, some really poor um, polygraphs that were coming in just like, you know, with commingled and like all these different pieces. They did targeted education and it worked, right? So like. You can go to households if you know that they're causing big problems, sure. But then you also have to say, okay, you know, when you're in the inner city and someone has a recycling bin, they're using it as a waste bin, and no, you know, like there, it's a contract. So, you know, there's a there's so many different layers to this. And again, there's waste and recycling in every single facility. And you know, I mean, the whole United States, right? We have to have it everywhere we have people we attract, right? Or, or something. That's a very basic question. Um, so we have these nickname batteries on devices. Well, how do they actually cause a fire when it gets to a casing of cracks? Is that what happens? Well, so typically, I mean, typically, you, you're going to see, like, if it's too cold, if it's too hot, and this is like, why does it start in your house, or why does it start in your pillow, right? Like, you know, there's, typically, they're overheated, they're underheated, they're overcharged, right, which is, you know, typically, people will leave them in, it. and again, I hate to say this, but but the reality is is you need to make sure you're buying from legitimate places, right? Because when people cut corners, people being manufacturers and they cut corners on the batteries, that's gonna cause more fires, right? So lithium ion batteries, my understanding is that it's like a very small percent actually have an issue out of manufacturing, right? They're very safe technology. I mean, it's like anything else. Everyone's saying like there's all these EV fires. When you put it against what all, you know, the the or diesel fires or gasoline fires, I mean it's really not anything crazier than it's ever been. It's actually might be less. The problem is, is that once the fires start, you're dealing with it in a different way than you've ever had in the past. So, you know, usually what we see is a loader will drive over it, right? And the minute that loader touches it, and it's like you literally broke an all membrane and a fire starts. Like, you know, that's or you, you put it through, you know, the the um, you, know, you put it through the, the meter truck. It's hit. We are rough on our trash, right? Like, you know, you're basically. I mean, one of the big fire engineers when I first started basically said that we as a public create bombs, right? Like we put bombs in our trash. And what he was saying is it's nothing with batteries. It's like, you know, you're in the summer 
and you go and you change your oil and you have all these rags that are soaked with, you know, I mean, it's all oil cellar, you throw them into, a, you know, these lab bags that are free ply you don't want it to smell, so you make this thing as tight as possible and you throw it in your curbside. Curbside's 90 degrees, it cooks up to 120. Now you drop it into, a, you know, a, you know, a, 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 a truck, right? It gets cracked, you know, like, if, if it gets smacked against an aerosol or any spark, you literally create a bottom top, right? And, and again, that's part of, you, know, you can't break the chain when you're in, you know, a, 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 you know when you're in the, the bin, right? Like, how do you break that chain? And that's really the problem, right? I think for trucks, you need to lose systems which they have, which I don't understand what they're talking about. Sorry. No, and just to add to what Mike said too, you mentioned, you know, manufacturer, producer responsibility, but, and now you said something earlier, and this truly is good. We did a study in Marquette. We had a, a, a lithium ion battery fire every week every single week and I we, we got a grant through Eagle through um, Steve Noble and the e site and we did education and we cut those fires out significantly but I, I but when you said that it made me think there's a lot of infrastructure grants that continue to come on each year that are more geared towards recycling and those bigger infrastructure pieces and to what you said about the education versus spending the money on something that's going to prevent it maybe some more money to HHW Program. Mm -hmm. I know there was seed money in the early 90s, which I think Marquette program started in 94, but since then, I'm not sure if there's been dollars allocated to HHW specifically where there's that opportunity to pull them all. We pull a lot of batteries out of the, out of the stream with those e waste grant dollars, and it, it made a huge difference. But we, we literally had one a week, and it was a, a, a drill battery or an OCTOP battery. So we did the work to show it. And I think maybe that's just another component because we see a lot of dollars for let's build a Merc, let's do this, but these are the things that are burning us down. Yeah. So maybe that's where some dollars could be out to make those programs stop. Well, yeah, and, and I, I think at the end of the day, right, like using your fire department as your front line of defense, as your first line of defense, is not acceptable from a regulatory perspective anymore, right? And again, I'm not. It's this is being driven by a lot of different things, but you know the reality is that you have a fire that you could stop, and then you're putting a million gallons of water. And again, when I say a million, like I mean, you know, there's like three pools full. Like I mean, it, in all my articles, I kind of walk through like how many Dixie cups it you know it would fill. And, and again, there's something called fire water, which fire water is literally what it is. Says like any water you use, put on a fire. Now, literally, I mean that it's contaminated, right? Like if you're gonna tell me like I mean it sprays on and goes somewhere. Well, if you're using a million gallons, like, you know, there's, it's a matter of time, and there's the environmentalists, right, I hate to use that as a term, but like, the reality is they're seeing this and knowing that it's like, and it's stoppable. So then, you know, we already have a bad reputation in the industry as waste recycling operators, right? We're dirty, we, you know, cause vibrations and explosions, and again, the poor scrap operators, but the smells and all these different things. Well, you know, and, there's guys out there like John Sacco with Sierra and others who are trying to basically change the reputation of the industry to like, hey, you don't want to have a scrap metal yard, but again, that scrap metal person is, they're literally doing more recycling for you than anybody else in the world, right? So it's, it's really trying to change the narrative. And to me, that's the education that needs to get out there, right? It's not like, to me, it, that money could be spent in a different way to help the industry, but also it has to be solved, right? So, you know, there's, we are capitalists, but the reality is, is, you know, most of our stuff has some sort of government regulation involved. And, you know, if the manufacturer has the ability to charge us for what, you know, we, what problems we're causing when we do things wrong, then if they're the best people to do it, great. If it's the states, great. Like, I don't care who does it, right? I just know that at a certain point, like, something has to change because, you know, we can't just pray and hope that, like, energy efficiency programs in, you know, in the 90s that, program like this is just gonna you know, get out there and everyone's gonna just realize one day that batteries are dangerous. I mean, there are just trillions and trillions, I don't even show the hockey stick anymore, mm -hmm. because I mean, there are trillions of batteries being made. So even if you hear of the new technology, that new technology is like, it's 30 years away, like, it's 20 years away. It's like, you know, but before it gets commercialized. So, you know, we're gonna be dealing with this for a long, a long period of time. Either. Right, it, you know, at the risk of sounding like a commercial for fire over, which I've done repeatedly over the last six years, um, one of the things that we were really pleased with is that they worked with us at our facility specifically. So in addition to 
their off-the-shelf system that you saw here with the big shipping container and the nozzles and the cameras. We've got two additional areas of coverage in our plan where they basically modified their available technology to fit our specific need so that we had un underprotected areas better protected and including just this Friday night where the, the cameras detect uh, a hot spot on an incline conveyor and auto shut off the system. And so as a consequence, <coughs> that just happens automatically. So there's internal audio and visual alarms and the conveyors are shut off. And the, the team knows when that happens, that there's a hot spot on a specific conveyor and to go to that with the handhelds, it's actually out of target range for the, the fire over nozzle. But that is an area that we recognize early on needed some sort of protection and fire rover is able to accommodate that. So we get early warning, we get uh, you know clear and concise information, and then that operator, remote operator, is on the phone with the management team as soon as that happens, and it's a coordinated response that wouldn't happen without the fire rover system being in place. So. And again, I, I, I appreciate, I mean, because it really it's one of those things where, again, I had no idea we were gonna do this, so that's great. I mean, so, but, but I mean, the reality is, is that we, most of our customers add cameras and, like, and nozzles after, right? Like, we've only lost one customer since we started, and they went bankrupt. It was a small scrap metal facility in Texas. So, like, most of the time, once once they're comfortable with the technology, and again, I call it the skin, because the reality is, if you're building a facility from scratch, you don't need to put in a sprinkler system and put in the fire rover system. You can put in a sprinkler system hybrid with the fire rover system built into it. Right, so you wouldn't have the box, you just have nozzles and cameras. And you know, again, like if we were gonna do like Brad's over again, he didn't have water, so I needed to move boxes. So, you know, but the reality is if you have access to water, then we can, you know, we, we could I mean I wouldn't replace it here, it wouldn't make sense, but it would make it makes sense anytime you have line of sight or you're outdoors. So, um, and we will I mean we do a ton of different equipment, preemptive maintenance, I mean all these different things that you're talking about and like he stops and others, I mean we're really trying to push the needle with our yeah, I always say like, well, you know, it's not me that you want to the more and think about it. It's a hundred guys that work for me that you want to live or work with me that you want to have, um, you know, fighting the fire. So you don't have to worry about that for more. We actually do. And then you get an email in the morning, you're like, hey, look what happened last night. And, you know, I mean, it, it definitely is, is peace of mind. But the most important thing that it is, is risk mitigation, ongoing business, and it's insurance, right? I mean, it really is that insurance. I just add one more thing. The res when you do have an incident, Fire Rover will provide a report as well as video footage. And I, I literally wasn't kidding. I spent an hour and a half last night looking at footage that I got from their team from our Friday night fire. So I could assess not just Fire Rover's response, but watch the employees on site, evaluate their performance during that incident, watch the fire department as they arrive and evaluate their performance while on site. So there's a lot of value to being able to have those after action reports and associated video. And looking at not just regular cameras, but thermal imaging cameras as well. Thank you.